It's Chemistry Paper 1 May 2017. This question is about atomic structure. Write the full electronic configuration for each of the following species. Cl minus. So first of all, you've got to find out what the atomic number is or the proton number, the number of protons and electrons in a Cl atom. So you'll find out that that's 17 if you look it up in the periodic table. But the minus means that it's gained one more electron. A minus means it's gained an electron. So let's have a look at the 17 Cl. So it fits 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p5. Let's just check that. 2 add 2 is 4, add 6 is 10, add 2 is 12, add 5 is 17. So we've accounted for all 17 electrons. Let's just check again then. Cl is in group 7 of the periodic table. So it have, should have 7 electrons in its outer energy level. So in its outer energy level, the third energy level, it's got 2 in the S level and 5 in the P level. 2 add 5 is 7. It's got 7 in the third energy level from the nucleus. So it's in group 7. So that's correct. If it's a minus, then it's gained an electron. So it gains one more. Well, all of these uh, orbitals are now full. So it needs to go into the 3P. So it becomes 3P6. Fe2 plus, so let's have a look at the uh, atomic number of Fe, which is 26. So it's going to fit 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s0, 3d6. Or you could have the 3d6 before the 4s. But what you must understand is that if it loses two electrons, because, because it's become 2 plus, 2 plus, two electrons, then they lose them from the 4s before they lose them from the 3d. So it becomes 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. It loses the s electrons before the 3d. So let's take the two, ele two electrons from the 4s. So it becomes 4s0, 3d6. Or you can leave the s electrons out completely and just have it as 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 3d6. Write an equation including state symbols to represent the process that occurs when the third ionization energy of manganese is measured. Well, first of all, manganese is Mn, and whenever you're talking about ionization energy, you're going to be talking about gaseous atoms. So we need the G symbol, state symbol. MNG to show it's a gaseous atom. Its first ionization energy is when one mole of uh, gaseous atoms loses one mole of electrons to make one mole of gaseous ions. So 1 mole, 1 mnG goes to 1 mn plus g plus an electron. I've lost 1 mole of electrons from 1 mole of gaseous manganese ions to make 1 mole of gaseous mn plus ions. That's the first ionization energy. Second ionization energy is to do that again, but with 1 mole of mn mn1 plus ions to make 1 mole of mn2 plus ions plus 1 mole of electrons. And then the third ionization energy to do it again to move remove the third electron. So 1 mole of mn2 plus gaseous ions making 1 mole of mn3 plus gaseous ions plus an electron. State which of the elements, magnesium and aluminium, has the lower first ionization energy. Explain your answer. Well, here I've got period 1, hydrogen, helium. Then I've got period 2, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. Then I've got period 3. So uh, I've got sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine and argon. Then I'm into period 4 with potassium and calcium. Now you'd expect um, them to go up across period one because um, as you go across a period you get more protons so you get more nuclear attraction holding onto the electrons more tightly and therefore a larger first ionization energy and the atoms get smaller and again you'd expect it to go up during period two as you get more and more and more protons across to neon same amount of shielding so more and more protons uh, more and more nuclear attraction for the electrons and again across period three more and more protons as you go left to right across the period uh, same amount of shielding because same uh, same number of uh, shells um, and therefore you'd expect it to go up and then so forth however there's a few anomalies there seems to be a few anomalies let's have a look at period three because it's talking about magnesium and aluminium in period three but i could be talking about period two um, let's have a look. It goes up to magnesium and then comes down to aluminium and then it goes up to silicon, up to phosphorus and slightly sort of down or across to sulfur. So why does it come down to aluminium? And it's because you've got 3s, 3s1, 3s2 and then you've got 3p1. So that's got these have got s orbitals 
3s1 and 3s2 and that's got 3s2 3p1 so when you're talking about the first ionization energy from here you're removing the electron from a 3s orbital whereas here you're removing it from a 3p orbital now a 3p orbital is further from the nucleus and if it's further from the nucleus there's less nuclear attraction it's more easily removed your answer is aluminium because the outer electrons in a 3p orbital which is further from the nucleus and therefore has a lower uh, first ionization energy because uh, further away from nucleus it's got a lower nuclear attraction. The sample of nickel was analysed in a time of flight mass spectrometer. The sample was ionised with electron uh, impact ionisation. Uh, that means that you fire electrons from something called an electron gun, you bombard it with high energy electrons and it removes electrons from the atom. So what actually happens is nickel atoms would have other electrons fired at them via an electron gun, high energy electrons bombarding these atoms, and it would remove an, at, uh, an electron from the nickel, so it become Ni1+. Plus. And that means that it's attracted down the uh, mass spectrometer tube towards some uh, plates that are charged minor, so it gets accelerated towards those, and then would hit the detector at the end when the Ni1 plus ion then receives an electron and forms the atom Ni again. Um, and in removing the electron from the plate, that generates a current, and the larger the current, then the greater the abundance or uh, the more common these atoms are. Mz means the mass of the atom divided by the charge. Well, let's assume that all the charges are 1 plus. So the mass divided by 1 plus is just its mass. So we've got nickel atoms um, forming nickel ions, Ni1 plus ions, and these are the masses. And these are the abundances, the amounts of each. So I've got um, nickel ions mass 58, so Ni1 plus ions mass 58, and there's 61% of those. Uh, I've got Ni1 plus ions mass 60 um, with 29.1% of those and some Ni1 plus ions mass 61 and there's only 9.9% of those. So let's imagine that there's 100% means, um, let's imagine we've got 100 of these ions. Uh, 61 of these uh, ions out of the 100 have a mass of 58, 29.1% uh, of the ions have a mass of 60 and 9.9 .9 of the ions have a mass 61. So um, mass 58 we've got 61 of these, uh, mass 60 we've got 29.1 of those and mass 61 we've got 9.9 .9 of these out of 100% or 100 of these ions. Um, so imagine there's 50, 50, 100 particles, 58 of them have mass 61, so let's multiply those two together. So their combined mass is 61 multiplied by 58, 3538. Uh, I've got, six, I've got um, nickel ions mass 60 and I've got 29.1 of those, so 29.1 uh, Ni plus uh, ions have a mass of 60, so their combined mass is 29.1 multiplied by 61, 746. And I've got 9.9 .9, uh, Ni1 plus ions mass 61, so multiply those two together, so their combined mass is 603.9. So if I add up the mass of all of these particles, the 3538, uh, added to the 1746, added to the 603.9, I end up with 5887.9. That's the mass of all of these atoms. I've got 100 atoms, that's what I decided at the beginning. So if I divide by 100, so the total mass divided by the number of particles gives me the average mass of a particle, 58.9. I've put it to one decimal place because these values are to one decimal place. So when it says, oh, it says give your answer to one decimal place anyway. So I've given it to one decimal place uh, to uh, concur with these ones to make it similar to these ones here. That I've got one decimal place. I've also, sorry, I need to backtrack here, give the symbol including the mass number of the ion which will reach the detector first in the sample that's the lightest one so the lightest one travels the fastest they've all got the same kinetic energy um, and having the same kinetic energy the same amount of movement energy kinetic energy the lightest one goes the fastest so that's 58 ni1 plus uh, so it's got a mass of 58 it's ni it's nickel it's one plus because it's an iron because it's been bombarded with 
high energy electrons from an electron gun so that it can be accelerated down the um, mass spectrometer tube and also so that when it's one plus and it hits the detector at the end and receives an electron back uh, to form and uh, to turn the iron back into an atom therefore it will generate a current which um, the larger the current will tell me the abundance uh, the larger the uh, current the larger the abundance the amount that I have Question two, a question about energetics. Write an equation including state symbols for the reaction with an enthalpy change equal to the enthalpy of formation of iron three oxide. So first of all, you've got to work out what iron three oxide is. Iron three, Fe is iron three, must, means, means it's Fe three plus oxide, an O ending, oxygen's in group six, with an oxidation state of minus two, it means it forms two minus ions, gains two electrons to fill up its outer shell to get eight electrons. So it's three plus and two minus. So if it's three plus and two minus, it must be two three pluses and three two minuses. It must be Fe2O3. So the three, two three pluses balance out with the three O2 minuses. Uh, the next clue is that it's enthalpy of formation. So formation is to make one mole of it. So we've got to make one mole of this. It's a solid um, and it's got to be formed from elements as you'd find them in the, in the laboratory. So as you'd find them in their standard states. So enthalpy of formation to make one mole of this from uh, elements in their standard state. So oxygen is a gas and iron is a solid. And to make two F Fe2, I'm going to need two Fe's, and three O's is going to be one and a half O2. That's your better answer. They will allow this one where you double it up, uh, but that's your better answer because it makes one mole of Fe2O3, uh, and that fits with the enthalpy of formation. Table 2 contains some standard enthalpy formation data. Here's an equation. Use these data and the equation for the reaction of iron 3 oxide with carbon monoxide to calculate, calculate a value for the standard enthalpy formation of carbon dioxide. So, what you've got is you've got this reaction here. We know that's got an enthalpy value of minus 19, this reaction, because it tells us it here. I've got the enthalpy of formation of carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is formed from carbon and oxygen, as you find them, find them in their normal um, states, in their normal states in the laboratory. Carbon and oxygen to make carbon monoxide. Now, to make one mole of carbon monoxide here, it's minus 111. So to make three moles of carbon monoxide, it's three times minus 111, three uh, times this value here to make three moles of carbon monoxide. To make Fe2O3, it's minus 822. So from elements in their standard states, so from some iron and some oxygen, then it's minus 822 for this reaction here. And therefore, to make iron from elements in their standard states, to make this Fe here, well, Fe is already Fe, so that's zero. And to make three moles of CO2, um, so I don't know that, that's what I want to try and find out, find the standard enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide. So I've got to find this value here, the enthalpy of formation of carbon dioxide from elements in their standard state. So all these elements in their standard states are either making or uh, making products here or making reactants here. And I've got the values of each of them, minus 822, 3 times 1, minus 1110, and 3 times something that I don't know that I've got to work out. So minus 19 from here to here equals this one from here to here, this one from here to here, and then coming round in this direction. So I've got to reverse the sign of 822, so that's plus 822. So minus 19 equals plus 822 to come round in this direction. 3 times uh, minus 111 is minus 333, three, three. but I've got to reverse that sign because I want it coming around in this direction. So plus 333, three, three, plus 0, and plus 3 times the CO2 that I don't know. Um, I can then take these to the other side. So minus 19 is minus 822, two, minus 333, three, three, minus 1174. So the CO2 divide by 3 and it comes out as minus 391.3 and it's in kilojoules per mole. So enthalpy data are given in table 3. Use, use the data from table 3 to calculate the bond enthalpy of NH in ammonia. So let's take this equation here. 
the entropy value is minus 92 in this direction. So we must have some equations here. We've got n2 to 2n. n2 to 2n is plus 944. We've got 3 times 436 because we've got an h2 going to a 2h. So h2 going to 2h. 3h2 uh, must be 3h2 going to 6h. So we've got this value here going to 6h. And um, I'll need to work out this value, nh3 to um, 2n plus 6h. So this is my missing uh, piece here. So minus 92 is 944. It's going in the right direction. Uh, plus 3 times 436. And I want to work out what this value here is. It's going in the other direction. Minus 2 times NH3. Because that arrow needs to go in this direction. So these the N2 and 3H2. Coming down to these chemicals here. These, these atoms. And then going to two, two lots of NH3. If I reverse that sign. Is minus 92. So let's take this across the other side. 2 NH3 is the same as 944 plus 1308 plus 92. 2 lots of NH3 um, is 2344. 1 NH3 is 2344 divided by 2, which is 1172. Now, it actually wants to know the strength of an NH bond. So I've got the, I've got, um, the value to make NH3. Uh, and NH3 has got 3 NH bonds. So if I divide by, that by 3, if I take this, 3 NH bonds in NH3, divide by 3, 390.7. But all these values um, here, I want to try and get to three significant figures, the same as these two values here, so 391. Give one reason why the bond depth that you calculate in question 2.3 is different from the mean bond depth we quote in the data book, uh, because there are other chemicals with an NH in them. So the data book value is different from um, different from other compounds, is, is different in other compounds. So what that means is that um, there are other compounds with NH bonds in there. So it's an average. The data book value is an average of all of the other, all compounds with NH bonds in there and not just NH3 molecules. Question three. A student planned and carried out an experiment to determine the entropy of reaction when magnesium metal here displaces zinc so we've got some zinc ions from an aqueous solution of zinc sulfate. So it's making magnesium ions and zinc. The zinc uses this method. Measuring cylinder is used to transfer 50 centimeters cubed of a 1.00 mole per decimeter cube. So that's interesting. I've got a volume and a concentration. Must want me to work out moles of aqueous solution of zinc sulfate. It wants me to work out the moles of zinc sulfate. The moment was placed in the beaker. 2.08 grams of magnesium powder added to the beaker. The mixture was stirred and maximum temperature recorded. Starting temperature, end temperature. Show by calculation which reactant was in excess. So first of all, as I say, I've got a volume and a concentration. I need to work out number of moles of zinc sulfate. So let's do that first of all. Volume's got to be in uh, decimeter cubed, not centimeter cubed. So to take a small unit value like centimeter cubed up into decimeter cubed, then I'm going to have to divide by a thousand, so 50 divided by a thousand, 0 0.05. Concentration is moles divided by volume, so 1, which is the concentration, equals moles divided by 0 0.05, which is my volume in decimeter cubed. Multiply the two numbers together to get moles 0 0.05. Now, magnesium then. So I've got 0 0.05 moles of zinc sulfate. It wants me to find out which reactant was in excess. What information I've got about the magnesium? I've just got the mass. But I know it's magnesium. I know magnesium has got um, a mass number of 24.3. So moles equals mass over MR. So moles uh, equals mass over MR. Uh, moles equals the mass. 2.08 grams divided by 24.3, 0 0.0856. So I've got 0 0.05 moles of zinc sulfate. I've got 0 0.0856 moles of magnesium. So there's more moles of magnesium than there are um, zinc sulfate. Therefore, the magnesium is in excess. So that's for that mark there. Use the data to calculate the experimental value for the entropy of reaction in kilojoules per mole. Assume the specific heat capacity. Well, I've given a I've been given a specific heat capacity, 4.18. The only equation I need to use now is delta H equals minus mc delta t. So the temperature change, I've got the temperature at the start and the end, it's gone from 23.9 up to 20, up to 61.2. So subtract that two, I've got 37.3. Um, 
that's going to be in Kelvin or degrees C. It doesn't really matter because a temperature change in Kelvin and a temperature uh, change in degrees C is exactly the same. Uh, specific heat capacity is C. That's 4.18. Um, mass is the mass of the liquid. So um, density of a solution. So something, something that's uh, mainly water, 50 centimetres cubed is 50 grams because the density of water is 1. So I've got 50 grams of water. So M is 50. So delta H equals minus 50 multiplied by 4.18 multiplied by the temperature change 37.3, 7795.7 joules. Um, it wants it in kilojoules per mole. So joules up into a larger unit value of kilojoules. Then I've got to divide by 1,000. So if I divide that by 1,000, it's 7.796 kilojoules. That matches what I'm asked for it in kilojoules. So 0 0.05 moles of zinc sulfate produces 7.79 kilojoules. What I do is I divide both of these numbers by 0 0.05. So I take the 0 0.05, divide it by itself. That means 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.05 is scaled up to one mole now. Reacts to produce um, 7.7 nine six kilojoules divided by 0 0.05 is one five six kilojoules per mole it's going to be exothermic so it's minus uh, because it, the temperature has gone up so it's minus one five six kilojoules per mole and i'll put it to three significant figures because all of the other values are to three significant figures another student used the same method and obtained a value of enthalpy of reaction of minus one four two the data book value for the enthalpy is minus three one zero so um, why did they get an enthalpy change less than it should be and the answer is there's been some heat loss so there's been some heat loss and that's why not all of the um, some heat loss has been lost to the surroundings and the temperature change hasn't been measured sufficiently um, on the thermometer Suggest how the student's method and the analysis of the results could be improved in order to determine more accurate value of the enthalpy of reaction. Justify your suggestions. We've already said that the main error, or one of the errors, is heat loss. So let's insulate the beaker or use a polystyrene cup. Um, use a lid, draw a graph of temperature against time, and extrapolate the temperature back. And therefore, you can give, you can find um, a, a temperature rise at a certain uh, certain time such as uh, four four minutes uh, repeat the results and take an average question four when substances p and q react together to form substance r an equilibrium is established according to the equation so p plus q makes two moles of r the equilibrium constant constant expression kc is r squared divided by concentration of p divided by concentration of Q. So that's fairly standard from this equation where you've got the concentration of the product raised to the number of moles, which is 2, divided by the concentration of P and divided by the concentration of uh, Q uh, from the left-hand side as the reactants. One mole of P and one mole of Q were mixed in a container with, one, with volume 1 decimeter cubed. At equilibrium, X moles of P had reacted. The amount in moles of each P and Q at equilibrium is 1 minus X. Deduce in terms of X the amount in moles of R in the equilibrium mixture. Well, you always set it out as a table like this to start off with. So P plus Q makes 2R. So at the start, you've always got to lay it out like this. This simplifies things. So at the start, there's 1 mole of P and 1 mole of Q. And there's no R. There's no mention of R at the beginning. You won't have made any R right at the beginning because P and Q have not had a chance to react. It says at equilibrium, x moles of p had reacted. So if x moles of p have reacted, then it must mean that q moles of p have reacted, because one mole of p reacts with one mole of q. So x moles of p have reacted, x moles of q have reacted, and when one mole of p reacts, then two moles of r have reacted. So if x moles of p have reacted, then two moles of x, two x of r have been made rather. So x moles of p used up, x moles of q used up because 1 reacts with 1, and 1 mole of p makes 2 moles of r, so x moles of p have been used up to make 2 x moles of r. So what's left at equilibrium for this e equilibrium expression? So at the start there was 1 mole, take away x that's been used up, 1 minus x, q, 1 minus x, 
and r as there's two x uh, in the L equilibrium because there's nothing to start with and we've made two x. So I can replace all of these values in here. So uh, first of all, these are moles, by the way, and I've got to divide by volume, but the volume's one. So these numbers of moles divided by one, something divided by one is itself. So my Kc, which is 3.6 equals concentration of R squared, or the concentration of R is 2x squared, divided by the concentration of P, divided by the concentration of Q. So it's 1 minus x multiplied by 1 minus x, or 1 minus x squared. Now the square root everything, square root the 3.6, square root the 2x squared, and square root the 1 minus x squared, so square root everything, square root of 3.6 is 1.9, square root of 2x squared is just 2x, square root of 1 minus x squared is just 1 minus x, multiply both sides by 1 minus x, so 1.9 uh, multiplied by 1 minus x is 2x, um, expand these brackets, 1.9 times 1 is 1.9, 1.9 times x is 1.9x, so it's 1.9 minus 1.9x equals 2x, take the 1.9x across the other side, 1.9 equals 3.9x, x equals 1.9 divided by, that should say 3.9, equals 0 0.49. 0 0.49, so if x equals 0 0.49, deduce r, r equals 2x, so r is 2 multiplied by 0 0.49, divided by this number of moles, divided by the concentration, moles divided by concentration is, so, um, so, uh, the volume rather, moles divided by the volume, the volume is 1 decimeter cubed, so number of moles, not put, uh, 2 times 0 0.49 divided by the volume gives the concentration of R, 0 0.98 mole per decimeter cubed. Question 5, this question is about intermolecular forces, they're the forces of attraction between different molecules, so it might be something like a van der Waals force, a weak force between the electrons in one molecule and the uh, nucleus in the atoms of another molecule. It might be dipole-dipole attractions where you've got polar bonds within a molecule and the different delta plus and del de delta minuses in one molecule attract the delta plus and delta minuses in another molecule. Or it could be something like hydrogen bonding, which is a strong intermolecular bond uh, where you've got a hydrogen bonded to an oxygen, nitrogen or fluorine and you've got very different electronegativities between the oxygen, nitrogen and fluorine uh, and the H's. And so you get large delta plus and delta minuses, and therefore the intermolecular bonds, the bonds between the molecules, the attraction is very strong. Give the meaning of the term electronegativity. Well, it's the power of an atom to attract electrons along a bond towards itself. So the power to withdraw or attract a pair of electrons along itself, along the bond, along the covalent bond towards itself. Explain how permanent dipole-dipole forces arise in hydrogen chloride molecules. Well, first of all, uh, you've got a polar bond set up. The reason you've got a polar bond set up with delta plus and delta minuses in the molecule is that the Cl is more electronegative than the H. So the Cl gets a small minus and the H gets a small plus. So it's the difference in electronegativity with Cl being much more electronegative than the H that makes this polar bond, with the Cl getting a small delta minus and the H getting a small delta plus. And the dipole-dipole forces, remember that's an intermolecular bond, a bond between one molecule and the next, is where the delta plus on the H of one molecule attracts the delta minus on the Cl of another molecule. So you've got a polar bond within the molecule, delta plus and delta minus, because the Cl withdraws electrons towards itself along the covalent bond and leaves the H plus and the uh, Cl with a small delta minus, but it's the actual, the dipole-dipole is the attraction between the molecules, intermolecular bonds. Um, that's, that's what an intermolecular dipole-dipole attraction is. Complete table 4 by naming the shape of each molecule. SiH4, well Si, silicon's in group 4, so it's got 4 electrons in its outer shell. Those 4 electrons will, will bond with 4 H's to form 4 bonding pairs. Now if you have 2 or 3 bonding pairs, then the shape is planar. But as soon as you go above 3 bonding pairs, then you end up with something that isn't planar. 
with the exception of something like xenon tetrafluoride uh, but that's that's uh, it's a different conversation but most of the time if you have more than three bonding pairs you get linear with two bonding pairs you get trigonal planar with three bonding pairs then with four bonding pairs it goes into a three-dimensional structure which is a tetrahedral shape pH 3 well what's P P is phosphorus in group 5 5 electrons in its outer shell Three in bonding pairs with the three H's leaves a lone pair, a pair of electrons alone. So you've got a lone pair of electrons and three bonding pairs. Again, one add three is four, which is more than three. So it's not going to be planar. So they would normally spread out into a tetrahedral shape. However, um, you don't see the lone pairs when you describe the shapes. You, you, you know there's a lone pair there, but there are three bonding pairs. Three bonding pairs pushed um, into sort of together into the remaining part uh, of the shape so you don't see one of the pairs which is the lone pair and the other three then are in a trigonal pyramid shape um, instantly tetrahedral bond angle 109.5 every time you replace a bonding pair with a lone pair that 109.5 comes down by 2.5 so it comes down to 107 in the trigonal planar BCL2 straightforward one this beryllium is in group two so two electrons in the outer shell bonded to two cls two bonding pairs therefore it must be planar and it's linear with a bond angle of 180. ch3 cl carbon's in group four it's bonded to three hydrogens and a chlorine so it's got four bonding pairs it's tetrahedral with a bond angle of 109.5 tick of the molecule has got a permanent dipole uh, uh, well permanent dipole is when it's not symmetrical so if you get delta plus and delta minuses but it's perfectly symmetrical in all directions then they cancel each other out so i'm looking for something that's not perfectly symmetrical well tetrahedral is perfectly symmetrical so it's not um it's not that it's not uh, sih4 that's perfectly symmetrical and all the bonding pairs are the same so it's not this one uh, pH 3 isn't symmetrical you've got a lone pair of electrons and you've got three H's along uh, along sort of the bottom part of the shape in a trigonal pyramid uh, shape so that one will be BCL2 is perfectly linear with a B in the middle and two CLs at 180 so that one won't have so pH 3 will have and tetrahedral even though it's tetrahedral same as the first one um you've got a polar bond between the c and the cl so and then you've got th three other h's so it's not perfectly symmetrical in terms of its polarity so that one is as well question six balance the equations for the two stages in the process of extracting copper from rock so let's have a look here how can i start with this oxygen appears in a lot of the reactants and a lot of the products so oxygen is going to be balanced last i can also see that o2 is on its own there so once i've balanced all the other chemicals i can balance o2 at the end by looking at how many oxygens um, i need here to balance up so i'm going to leave the oxygen to the last i'm going to start with something that hasn't got any oxygen oxygens in it therefore maybe something like cu2s maybe something like cu FeS2, something simple without oxygens in. I'm going to go for this one. I'm going to assume this is a 1. Let's assume this is a 1, therefore. And now I've got 1S on this side, 2Cus. Let's have another 1 here. So if I put another 1 here now, I can balance the Cus out. I've got 2Cus there and I've got 2Cus there. That's got to be a 4. 4 Cus. Uh, balancing up with the four C's, four FE's now, four FE's on this side and it doesn't appear anywhere else apart from here so that's got to be a four, four SI's now, SI's don't appear anywhere apart from here so that's got to be a four, um, S's, SO2's here, how many SO2's, uh, eight S's there, two times four is eight S's I've got one S there, so that must now be a seven. And now I've got seven SO2s that I can balance up the oxygens last of all. So I've got one O there, 
and 14 O's and 15 O's, add 12 O's, 27 O's. On this side I've got 8 O's here, so I've got 19 O's in here. I've got 9.5 O2's in there. Let's have a look at this one. Again, copper appears in lots of places, and copper appears on its own there, so I can balance the copper last of all. Um, SO2, S's appear here, and S's appear here. So let's balance the S's first of all. Let's assume we've got one SO2 here, so one S here, so I must have one S here. Um, and then let's leave the C used until the end. I've got one O there, I've got two O's here, so this must be a two. That means that I've got two CU's there, four CU's there, I've got six CU's on the left, so that must be a six. Suggest two reasons why the sulfur dioxide byproduct um, of this process is removed from the exhaust gases. Well, if you let sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, it's going to cause acid rain. Um, also, sulfur dioxide causes breathing problems and it's poisonous or toxic. Any two out of those three. A passenger jet contains uh, 4050, 4050 kilograms of copper wiring. A rock sample contains 1.25% copper, uh, iron and sulfur S2 by mass, C-U-F-E-S-2 by mass, 1.25. So calculate the mass in tons of rock needed to produce enough copper wire, i.e. 4050 kilograms for a passenger jet. So let's assume, first of all, that I've got 100 grams of the rock sample. Out of the 100 grams of the rock sample, 1.25% is C-U-F-E-S-2. So if I had 100 grams of rock, 1.25% of the rock is this CUFES2. Therefore, 1.25 grams out of the 100 grams is CUFES2. Now, if I've got CUFES2, how much that 1.25 grams is actually copper? Well, I need to look at the masses of the atoms. The MR of CUFES2 is 1 Cu. 1 Fe and 2 S's, so that's 163.5, 155.8 and 232.1s, and it comes out as 183.5. Of this amount, 63.5, which is the mass of a copper, a Cu in there, is copper. So if we work that out as a fraction, 63.5 divided by 183.5 is 0.346. That's the fraction of this Cu Fe S2 rock. That is actually copper, around about a third. So 0.436 uh, of the 100 uh, as a fraction, 0.436 as a fraction of the 1.25 grams of rock is copper. Multiply the two together, 0.4325 grams of, out of 100 grams of rock, is copper. So out of every 100 grams of rock, I get 0.4325 grams of copper. I'm going to multiply it up by 10. So 100 grams of rock contains 0.4325 grams of copper. Multiply it up all up by 10. 1,000 grams, which is a kilogram of rock, contains times that by 10, 4.325 grams of copper. I'm going to now multiply it by 1,000. So uh, 1,000 grams or a kilogram times by 1,000 is one ton of rock. So multiply by 1,000, a kilogram, turns into a thousand kilograms multiplied by a thousand. In other words, a ton, it tells you there, a ton is a thousand kilograms. Multiply this by a thousand, 4.325 grams multiplied by a thousand is 4.325 kilograms of copper. So one ton of rock contains 4.325 kilograms of copper. If I divide both sides, the one ton and the 4.325 uh, kilograms by 4.325, 1 divided by 4.325 is 0.23 tonnes of copper, contains 1 kilogram of copper. Because 1 divided by 4.325 is 0.23, 4.325 divided by itself, 4.325 is 1. So 0.23 tonnes of uh, the rock contains 1 kilogram of copper. I need 4,050 4, multiplied by 4,050, 0.23 tons multiplied by 4050 936 tons contains 4050 grams of copper copper can also produce be produced by the reaction of carbon 
uh, with copper 2 oxide. There's carbon, there's copper 2 oxide according to the equation. Calculate the percentage atom economy for the production of copper by this process. Give your answer the appropriate number of significant figures. Well, what you do is you have a look at the products and you have a look at the mass of the product that you want, which is the copper, production of copper. How much copper compared to everything that I make? So what I do is percentage atom economy is the MR, the mass of what you want to make, divided by the mass of everything that's made, multiplied by 100. So I make two coppers. A copper has a mass of 63.5, that's its MR. So two 63.5s is what I actually want to make, divided by the MR of everything I make, which is two, which is the copper again, 2 times 63.5, add a 12, add two 16s, 127 divided by 171, multiplied by 100%, 74.27 is my percentage atom economy for the production of copper. Question 7. A solution Y is known to contain uh, one type of group 2 metal ion, so something like magnesium, Mg2+, plus, or calcium, Ca2+, plus, uh, and one type of negative ion. Aqueous solutions of sulfuric acid and magnesium nitrate add separate solutions of Y. The observations are shown in table 5. Something forms a white precipitate with sulfuric acid. Now, sulfuric acid makes sulfates, and I'm immediately thinking barium sulfate, because barium sulfate is a white solid used in barium meals. Uh, so I'm immediately thinking that barium might be the group 2 metal ion. Um, white precipitate forms with magnesium nitrate. That could be magnesium hydroxide, uh, magnesium um, carbonate, um, something like that. So I want barium something that's a solution. Uh, barium carbonate is a solid. Barium sulfate is a solid. Barium hydroxide is a solution because as you go up group, uh, as you go sorry down group two, then things uh, the hydroxides become less soluble. As you go up group two, something like magnesium hydroxide is less soluble. So barium hydroxide is looking good here. Barium hydroxide making barium sulfate with sulfuric acid and magnesium hydroxide as a white solid uh, is looking favourable. Barium hydroxide. Suggest the identity of the group 2 metal is barium, Ba2+, plus, um, and the ionic equation for rate takes place with sulfuric acid. Well, I know barium is Ba2+, plus because it's in group 2, so the ion loses two electrons to fill up its outer shell. You've got to know that a sulfate ion is SO42-, minus, so Ba2+, plus and SO42- minus make BaSO4. It's got no charge on it. Um, so 2 plus and 2 minus cancel each other, it's got no charge and that's why it's a solid because it's got no charge. Uh, the negative ion is a hydroxide ion, OH minus. Magnesium uh, Mg is 2 plus because uh, it's in group 2, so Mg2 plus losing 2 electrons to fill up its outer shell, Mg2 plus OH minus ion. Again, you've got to know that OH minus ion is a hydroxide ion, um, so it's going to make it's going to need two of those, two minuses to cancel out with the 2 plus, and it's going to form Mg OH in brackets twice. Got to be a bracket because I've got two atoms, two capital letters here, two symbols, so um, I'm going to need a bracket around it so that I can balance up both of those. Question 8. Um, give the oxidation state of nitrogen in the following species. So in NO2 minus. Well, I know an oxygen is in group 6, so it forms O2 minus ions. Oxidation state minus 2. So I've got 2 minus 2s is minus 4, and I've got a minus 1 left over. So the nitrogen must be in plus 3. Plus 3, minus 2, minus 2, leaves 1 minus left over. No charge over, over on the right hand side, so a nitrogen must balance with an oxygen. Oxygen minus 2 oxidation state plus 2 for the nitrogen. So plus 3 and plus 2. Write a half equation for the conversion of NO2- minus in the acidic solution into NO. So NO2- minus acid always provides H plus to make NO. My one problem is that where have the, um, where's the H gone here? So acid solution is H plus. I know I make NO, but where's this gone? Well, H's must combine with some O's to make some H2O. 
That's the only place the H's and the O's can go. You'll find that in half equations that involve electrons, by the way, then you can add H pluses and, and waters wherever you want to to make H's and O's balance. So H pluses and H two O's are always available to you when you're balancing half equations, that is, equations that have electrons in them. So I've put the water in there. Now I've got two H's, so I need two H pluses. Let's add up the number of pluses and minuses and put an electron in. If it's half equation, you've got to have electrons in on one side or another. I've got one minus, two one pluses. So that's one plus on the left hand side. No plus or minuses on the right hand side. So I need one minus on the left hand side. So that one minus and one minus is two minus to cancel out the two plus. Write an equation for the conversion of I minus into I2. Again, it's a half equation. So I minus going to I2. I'm going to need two I minuses to balance up the I2. And I've got two minuses on the left hand side, none on the right hand side. So I've got to put two electrons on the right hand side. Write an overall equation, ionic equation for the reaction of them both. Well, in this half equation here, you should always have electrons on the left. So, um, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So this is gaining electrons. This is a reduction equation. This is um, uh, losing electrons. So this is an oxidation half. So we've got a redox going on. But anyway, more importantly, to balance it, I've got one electron on the left hand side of this and I've got two electrons on the right hand side of this. So when I add everything from the left of both equations and put it on the left of my overall and everything on the right of both equations to add everything on the right of overall, I want the electrons to cancel and they're not going to. So I'm going to have to multiply this by two, everything by two. So two NO2 minuses, two times two is four H pluses, two E minuses, two NO2s and two H2Os. Now I've got two electrons on the left hand side of this equation here and I have two electrons on the right hand side already on uh, of my of the, this equation here. So when I had everything on the left, two NO2, four H plus plus two electrons plus two I minuses and then everything on the right, two NO2s plus two H2Os plus I2 plus two E minuses. My electrons cancel on the, out on each side. They have two NO2 minus four H plus two I minus two NO and two H2O plus I2. What is the role of NO2 minus in the reaction with I minus? So NO2 minus, we've said it's in oxidation state plus three to start off with, and it forms NO in the, uh, at the end of the equation. So I'm turning NO2 minus into NO. So it's going from oxidation state plus three down to plus two. So if it's going down an oxidation state, it's reduced. So it must be, if it itself is reduced, something else must be oxidized. It's an oxidizing agent. It actually oxidizes I minus in a minus one oxidation state up to I2, which is zero oxidation state. In this equation, then I've got two ClO3 minus and 5NO2 minus and 2H plus making Cl2, 5NO3 minus and H2O. A 25 centimetre cube sample of the sodium nitrate, nitrite, which is this one here, NO2 minus, um, required 27.4 centimetre cubed of a 0.02 mole per decimetre cubed solution of potassium chlorate 5, this is potassium chlorate 5 with the Cl in oxidation state 5. Let's just check that. So I've got three two minuses for my oxygens in group 6, gaining two electrons each. So they're two minuses. Three minus two is a minus six. Uh, plus Cl must be in plus five because plus five minus six leaves one minus left over. So this has come from the potassium chlorate 5 for a complete reaction. Calculate the concentration in grams per decimeter cube of the sodium nitrite, that's this one here, the NO2 minus in the sample. Well, first of all, I've got a volume and I've got a concentration of my potassium chlorate 5, which is this ClO3 minus. If I've got a volume and a concentration, it must want me to work out moles. So volume is not going to be in centimeter cubed, it's got to be in decimeter cubed. So to get a small unit value up into a bigger unit value, then I've got to divide by 1000, 0.0. .0 274 decimeter cube concentration is 0.02 concentration is moles divided by volume so 0.02 is moles divided by 0.0274 multiply the two together so the number of moles is 0.0548 moles 
of this potassium chlorate here. Calculate the concentration of sodium nitrite in the sample. So the sodium nitrite is this NO2 minus. Sodium nitrite makes NO2 minus. And I know that two moles of this potassium chlorate 5 react with 5 moles of the nitrite and 2 moles of the acid to make 1 mole of chlorine, 5 moles of nitrate ions and 1 mole of water. So the numbers in front tell you the mole ratios. So 2 moles of the potassium chlorate react with 5 moles of the sodium nitrate. 1 mole would react with 2.5. I've actually only got 0 0.000548 moles of the potassium chlorate 5. I've not got 1. So 1 makes 2.5 of the sodium nitrate, 0.000548 of potassium chlorate must react with 0.000548 times by 2.5 because it's in a 2 to 5 ratio. 0.00137 moles of sodium nitrite are getting used up. So now it's asking for the concentration. So I know how much sodium nitrate is in there now. Um, uh, during this complete reaction, that's 0 0.00137 moles of sodium nitrite. Um, so the volume of sodium nitrite is 25 centimetre cubed. It tells me that 25 centimetre cubed. 25 centimetre cubed in decimetre cubed divided by 1,000 to get a small unit value up into a larger one, 0 0.025. Concentration is moles divided by volume. I've got the number of moles. I've got the volume. Now I've got concentration, 0 0.0548. I've put it to three significant figures because um, the other values seem to be to three significant figures. Mostly I've got four significant figures there. I've got three significant figures. So I'm going to go with three significant figures, 0 0.0548. Question 9. Which is the correct crystal, crystal structure for the substance named? Iodine is molecular. It's I2. Just two atoms joined together uh, in a molecule. Simple molecular. That's correct. A is correct. Let's just check the rest. Now, diamond is macromolecular or um, giant covalent. So, sodium chloride. No, that's ionic because Na is in group 1. Cl chloride is in group uh, 7, so Na loses one electron, Na plus, and the chlorine atom, the Cl atom, gains it and becomes Cl minus and forms a giant ionic lattice. Uh, and graphite is, um, is giant covalent as well in layers, so it's not metallic, it's not a metal. Your answer is A. Which of the best techniques to remove silver chloride that forms when aqueous solutions of silver nitrate and sodium chloride react? Silver chloride is a white solid, so you'd remove that from the solution by filtration C. Which statement about astatine? Now, astatine is in group 7, but it's right down the bottom of group 7. It's a large molecule, with a uh, large atom rather, with its... Um, it does form form uh, astatine. It does form um, does have two astatine atoms joined together, um, like Cl two, like Br two, like I two, like F two. Um, large, greater electronegativity than bromine. The electronegativity is the the power to to withdraw or attract electrons along a covalent bond towards itself. No, it's not going to do that as well as bromine because it's larger and therefore the electrons are further away from the nucleus. So A isn't correct. Astatine is a better oxidizing agent. So oxida oxidizing agent means that it oxidizes something else. Something else is oxidized by it. That's what an oxidizing agent does. So itself is reduced. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. So it's basically saying that acetine is better at gaining electrons. No, it's a larger atom with its outer electrons further away from the nucleus. So uh, the nuclear attraction is less and it's not going to attract electrons onto its outer shell better than bromine. B is wrong. Acetine has a greater boiling point than bromine. It will have because it's got more electrons. So it's got an extra electron shell because it's lower down group 7. More electrons mean that it's going to have more van der Waals forces with adjacent 
acetine molecule, so C is right. Acetine has a greater first ionization energy than bromine. No, it's got a lower first ionization energy because the electrons are further away from the nucleus. So it has a local, less, less of a nuclear attraction. It's also got one extra shell, so more shielding. So your answer is C. Question 12, it's about time of flight mass spectrometry. So let's have a think about what mass spectrometry is. So you put a sample of gaseous ions into a tube, you bombard them with high energy electrons from something called an electron gun. Those high energy electrons bombard uh, the atoms, the gaseous atoms, and knock an electron off the atoms. So then instead of the atom, you've got an ion, a one plus ion. The one plus ion then gets accelerated down the tube towards negatively charged plates with holes in them. And it goes through those holes and hits a detector at the end. The one plus ions then hit the detector and accept an electron. So every time a one plus ion hits the detector, it accepts an electron and turns back into an atom again. And that creates um, a current. So uh, an electron being accepted off the plate by a one plus ion generates a current. So the more one plus ions hit the plate, the larger the current and the more abundant, that means how many there are, um, the more abundant the one plus ions are hitting the plate more of them generates more current. So the current in the detector is proportional to the ion abundance, the number of ions. A is correct straight away. Sample particles can t gain electrons to form positive ions. No, you lose electrons to form positive ions. Particles are detected in the order of their kinetic energies. No, another property of the particles is they've got the same kinetic energies. They've all got the same kinetic energies. They take longer to get down the, the plate. The longer they go they get to go down the plate, then um, the, the higher their mass is. Um, heavier particles tend to take longer to get down and hit the plate. Ions are accelerated by a magnetic field. No, they're accelerated by plates which uh, are negatively charged and have holes in them called perforated plates. So your answer is A. Chlorine exists as two isotopes, 35Cl and 37Cl, in the ratio of 3 to 1. It means for every four particles, three of them are 35Cl and one of them is 37Cl. Which statement about peaks in the mass spectrum Cl2 is correct? There's peaks at 70 and 74, 70, 72, 74, 70, 72, 74, 70 and 72. Well, there's going to be three kind of peaks. There's going to be, if it's got... Um, in Cl2, there's two Cl's, so they could either be both 35, uh, one could be 35 and one could be 37, or they could be both 37. That will give uh, peaks of 70 if they're both 35, two 35's are 70. If one is 35 and one is 37, that adds up to a mass of 72, and if they're both 37, two 37's are 74. So it's automatically either B or C, um, and let's have a look now uh, in terms of ratios. I'll do spoilers and we can walk through the maths. So, chance of a Cl atom being 35 Cl is three quarters. In other words, out of four particles, three of them will be 35 Cl. So three out of the four particles are 35 Cl. Similarly, the chance of a Cl particle is one part out of four, one quarter. Uh, the MR70 Cl2 contains two Cl two Cl's. The MR70, sorry, 70 contains two Cl35's. The MR72 contains the 35 and the 37 Cl, and the MR75 must contain two 37's. So, um, the chance of getting one 35 is three quarters. The chance of getting two 35's is three quarters multiplied by three quarters. If you put that into a calculator, it comes out as nine sixteenths. Or if you know your fractions, you multiply the top two numbers. Three times three is nine. Bottom two numbers, four times four is 16. Nine divided by 16, nine sixteenths. So the first ratio is nine. Well, they're both nine. So that hasn't helped me very much. Um, the last one is um, 74 is 2, 30, 37 CLs. So let's do that one. Quarter chance multiplied by a quarter chance. 1 times 1 is 1. 4 times 4 should say 16. So you've got a 1 16th chance. 1 out of 16. If you notice all the time it's out of 16. So I've got 9 16th chance, 6 16th chance, and 1 16th chance. 
Um, so the 9 and the 6 and the 1 add up to 16. The 9 and the 3 and the 1 add up to 13. So we've got 13 here, 9 13 and 3 13 and 1 13. So I know the answer is B straight away. But let's work out where the 6 comes from, 6 16. This is a bit trickier because I've got a 35 and a 37. So the chance of 3 quarters multiplied by 1 quarter. 3 times 1 is 3, 4 times 4 is 16. So that's the chance of uh, there being a 35 and a 37 CL in CL2, but they, they could be the other way around. So instead of 35, 37 CL bonded, it could be 37, 35 CL bonded. So I've got to double that number, so that's 6 sixteenths. So the answer is 9 to 6 to 1. A 0.485 gram sample of anhydrous sodium sulfate is dissolved in water and the solution made up to 250 centimetre cubed in a volumetric flask. What's the concentration of sodium sulfate in the solution? So concentration is number of moles divided by volume. I don't know the number of moles, so I need to work out turn grams into moles first of all. So let's work out what sodium sulfate is. How do I know what sodium sulfate is? Well, uh, sodium Na is in group 1, so it forms a 1 plus ion. You need to remember that sulfate is SO4, 2 minus. 1 plus and 2 minus isn't going to balance, so I'm going to need two 1 pluses to balance out with the 2 minuses. I'm going to need two Na 1 pluses to balance out with the SO4, 2 minus Na2, SO4. I can work out the MR now. Uh, Na is the 32s. The sulfur is 32.1, oxygen is 16, so I need four of them, 142.1. Moles is mass divided by MR. Uh, the mass is 4.85 grams divided by 142.1. I've got 0 0.034 uh, moles of sodium sulfate. Now I can use concentration equals moles divided by volume. Now that I've got a number of moles, I've got a volume of 250 centimetre cubed, needs to be in decimeter cubed, low unit value like centimetre cubed, up into a larger unit value. Now I've got to divide by a thousand, so 250 divided by a thousand is 0 0.250. Concentration, as I've said, is number of moles, 0 0.034 divided by 0 0.250, which is the volume in decimeter cubed, 0 0.137, and that's why my answer is B. Question 15. Which of these contains the greatest number of atoms? Quite a tricky question, this. First of all, they're in, um, some of them are in milligrams and kilograms, so I'm going to have to get that into grams, first of all. And then I'm going to work out number of moles, so I'm going to have to know the MR of each of these to work out the number of moles. Once I've got the number of moles, I could multiply each of them by Avogadro's number. Uh, to work out the number of particles that I've got and then if I look in each particle or molecule I could look at the number of atoms and multiply that up. Okay, let's have a look first of all. 127 milligrams is divided by, uh, sorry, divided by a thousand yet to get um, small unit value up into a large unit value. 1.27 is 0.127 grams. And I'm just going to go through the rest now and just work, work it out in grams first of all. 1.54 times 10 to the minus 4 kilograms. Kilograms down into grams. Then I multiply by a thousand, so this multiplied by a thousand is 0.154 grams. If I did the same here, milligrams uh, divided by a thousand to get into grams, 0.081. And here, kilograms to get into grams, 1.7 times 10 to the minus 4. I multiply by a uh, thousand to get grams down into, to kilograms down into grams, 0.17. So I've now got the masses of each of these. Now I'm going to work out the, uh, have a look at the M, the molecular formula of each of these. Iodine is I2, two atoms bonding together in group 7 to fill up their outer shells with a, with a single covalent bond. P4, four atoms come together, so four phosphorus atoms come together as P4, just something to remember. Carbon dioxide CO2 and ammonia NH3, so you need to remember those. Let's work out the MRs of each of those and therefore the number of moles. So moles is mass divided by MR, I2, 2, 126.9s, works out as 0 0.005 moles of iodine. Number of moles of P4. Um, I've got um, 100 and, uh, number of moles is the mass divided by the MR. Uh, the MR of P4, 4P is, is 123, uh, 0 0.00125. Um, 
CO2 is uh, 12 out of 2 sixteenths for the carbon and the 2 oxygens. Mass is 0 0.081 divided by 44, 0 0.0018. And the ammonia is a 14 add 3 ones for the hydrogens, 0 0.017 for the mass, divided by the MR of 17, 0 0.01. Now then, I've got the number of moles. I could multiply each of these by Avogadro's number to get the exact number of particles. But if I'm just working out the greatest number of atoms, I'm just doing the same thing through. So I'm not going to multiply by the number by Avogadro's number each time because um, you'd just be doing the same. So if I'm making a comparison of the greatest number, I'm just wasting my time here. So I'm not going to bother, and but I am going to multiply by the number of atoms in each of the molecules because it's asked for number of atoms rather than number of particles so there's two i's in i2 so multiply by 2 0 0.001 p4 there are four in p4 so multiply by 4 0 0.005 um, multiply by 3 because there's a carbon and two oxygens at 0 0.015 um, And ammonia, there's one N and four, uh, three H's, four atoms in NH3, multiplied by four, 0 0.02. So the largest value, therefore, is D at 0 0.02 of all of the answers. 25 centimeter cubed samples of sodium hydroxide were taken by, uh, by pipette from a beaker. These then titrated with aqueous solution of ethanoic acid. The concentration of the ethanoic acid calculated from the experimental results was found to be lower than the actual value. How could this explain the difference? So the concentration of the ethanoic acid calculated from the experimental results was found to be lower than the actual value. So concentration is moles divided by volume. Okay. If the concentration is too small, then the number of moles is too small. So concentration is moles divided by volume. And if the concentration is too low, then the number of moles is too low. Now, why could the number of moles be too low? Well, another reason that the concentration could be too low is that the volume is too big, because when you divide by a big number, then the concentration would be lower. So maybe the volume is too big. This could be because the volume from the burette is too high. So there's two reasons why the concentration of ethanoic acid might be too low. Maybe there's not enough moles, or maybe the volume from the burette is too high, because if you divide by a large number, then the number, the concentration would be smaller. So maybe the volume is too high. So um, here, rinsing the, pure, rinsing the burette with distilled water before filling up uh, with ethanoic acid. Um, the, the water in the burette is mixed with the ethanoic acid, making it less concentrated than expected. So more would be needed to add it from the burette. So its volume would be larger. So the answer is B, because you're diluting the ethanoic acid in the burette. It's less concentrated, so you need more than you expected. Uh, your answer is B. Question 17. I've got a 20 centimetre cube sample of 0 0.4 mole per decimeter cube concentration aqueous solution of a metal bromide it says it's uh, m is the metal and the br with n number of brs it's not telling me the number of brs um, uh, in the formula reacts with 160 centimeter cube 0 0.1 mole decimeter cube of silver nitrate so immediately if i've been given volumes and concentrations i need to work out numbers of moles so let's work out numbers of moles so Concentration is moles divided by volume. In 20 centimetre cube, we need to get into decimetre cube by dividing by 1,000. So a small unit value up into a larger unit value, I divide by 1,000. 20 divided by 1,000 is 0 0.02. So concentration 0 0.4 is moles divided by 0 0.02. Multiply the two numbers together. 0 0.008 moles of this metal bromide. Silver nitrate. Now, silver nitrate is 160 centimetres cubed. So divide by 1,000 to get into decimetre cube, 0.1. 0.6. Uh, 0.1 is its concentration. Concentration is moles divided by volume in decimeter cube. 0.1 uh, is moles divided by 
um, 0.16. So in moles, the two numbers multiplied together, 0.1 multiplied by 0.16 is 0.016. Now, if you actually look, the number of moles of silver nitrate needed is double, 0. double that of the metal bromide, that is 0. 0.008 eight times two is 0 0.016 now silver from silver bromide sorry silver from silver nitrate reacts with br minus from the metal bromide in a ratio of one to one ag1 plus and br1 minus makes agbr so this is the silver nitrate and this is the bromide so they would react one to one so why do i need twice as much silver nitrate as I do from the metal bromide and the answer is I need twice as much silver nitrate as I do metal bromide is because there's two bromides in the metal bromide so one of these one metal bromide MRBR2 when it reacts is making two moles of BR2 and that's why I need two twice as much AGBR because I'm getting twice as much BR- minus made from one mole of MBR2 Which species has one or more bond angle of 90 degrees? CH4, carbon's in group 4, so it's got 4 electrons in its outer shell. Bond's 4 hydrogens, uh, so it's got 4 bonding pairs, no lone pairs. Um, 4 bonding pairs, so any uh, 2 bonding pairs is linear, bond angle 180. Uh, 3 bonding pairs is trigonal planar. Um, bond angle 120. Once you get to 4 then it stops being planar anymore and that's in a tetrahedral shape of a bond angle 109.5. NH4 plus, so nitrogen's in group 5. Um, if it's plus it's lost an electron so it's only got 4 electrons in its outer shell. Bonds 4 hydrogens, 4 electrons in its outer shell, bonds 4 hydrogens, it's got 4 bonding pairs. Again that's going to be tetrahedral shape, bond angle 109.5. Um, let's have a look at this one then. Let's go to D. Al is in group 3. If it's got a minus, then it's got 3 electrons in the outer shell, and a minus means it's got 4 electrons in the outer shell. Bonds the 4 minuses, 4 Cl's, so it's got 4 bonding pairs, no lone pairs. That's tetrahedral bond angle 109.5 as well. So the answer must be C. C. Let's check. Cl has got 7 electrons in its outer shell. It minus means it's got one more. It's got eight electrons in its outer shell. Four of them are bonded. So it's got four bonding pairs and it's got four electrons left over because it's got eight in its outer shell. Four bonded, four left over. So it's got two lone pairs and four bonded pairs. Now, due to the electron pair repulsion theory, electron uh, lone pairs of electrons repel as far away as possible. So they've got the maximum repulsion. So they're going to go at 180. And the four bonding pairs then are going to be around a square planar shape um, to, to separate them as far away as they can from the two lone pairs. So if they're in a square planar shape, they're gonna have a bond angle of 90. So your answer is C. Question 19, the forward reaction in this equilibrium is endothermic. So that means when it goes left to right, it goes in this direction, left to right, it's endothermic, so it takes in heat. So CO, Cl2, turn into CO and Cl2, takes in heat in that direction. In the other direction, it must be exothermic and give out heat. Let's read through the statements and work out which one's correct. If the total pressure is increased at a constant temperature, the proportion of CO, Cl2 in the equilibrium mixture will increase. The total pressure, what the total pressure does is if we increase the pressure, it uh, by Le Chatelier's principle, it'll try and lower the pressure by lowering the volume. And it'll try and take, say, for example, two molecules here on the right down into one molecule here on the left. So increasing the pressure, Le Chatelier's principle, lower the pressure by taking two moles of gas on the right down into one. So the equilibrium would shift to the left hand side. The proportion of CO, Cl2 in the equilibrium mixture, the amount of this would increase. So A is wrong. The use of a catalyst will increase the pro proportion of Cl, Cl, CO, Cl2 in the equilibrium mixture. No, it doesn't. Um, a catalyst just increases the forward, speed of the forward and the backward directions and increases the speed at which equilibrium is, is reached. It doesn't actually shift the position of equilibrium to the left or to the right. 
So B is wrong. Reducing the equilibrium concentration of CO will increase the value of the equilibrium constant. No, the only thing that alters the, the value of an equilibrium constant is temperature. So nothing else will do that. So the answer must be D. Raising the temperature, raising the temperature will increase the value of the equilibrium constant. So let's think about that. Temperature could increase the value of the equilibrium constant. Yes, it could. So that's very much a possibility. Temperature is the only thing that can alter the value of an equilibrium constant. Increasing the temperature will let um, its endothermic going left to right. So um, it will it will take in heat if you go left to right. If I increase the temperature. Um, by Lyschelius principle, it will try and lower the temperature of the surroundings. It can lower the temperature of the surroundings by uh, using this reaction to take in some of the heat, and it will shift to the right-hand side. If it shifts to the right-hand side, the equi equilibrium constant is the concentrations of the chemicals on the right-hand side, the products, divided by the concentration of the reactants on the left. So if I'm getting more products, yes, the equilibrium constant is increasing. Yes. The answer is answer D. Which of these is not a redox reaction? So redox reaction means that something's uh, reduced and something's oxidized. So let's find something in here where there's no reduction or oxidation because something must be oxidized and something must be reduced. Let's have a look at the copper here. Oxygen's in minus two oxidation state, no charge left over, so minus two. What number multiplied by two will cancel out a minus two? That's a plus one. So the copper's in plus one because plus one and another plus one is plus two to balance out the minus two of the oxygen in minus two oxidation state. It's in minus two oxidation state because it's in group six and gains two electrons and becomes two minus iron. Copper here. Uh, sulfurs in group 6 plus 6 and oxygen as we said is minus 2, 4 minus 2 is a minus 8, plus 6 minus 8 leaves minus 2 from the S and the 4 O's, minus 2 from the sulfate. You might know that sulfate ion is SO4, 2 minus anyway, 2 minus from the SO4 so the copper must be in plus 2 so it's gone from plus 1 up to plus 2 it's been oxidized, there's oxidation going on there and there must be probably some reduction as well. But certainly this, um, I've found some evidence of oxidation or reduction in A. So let's see in B. Mg, Mg, O, Mg must be in plus 2. O is 2 minus, um, so that must be plus 2. Cl, Cl is in group 7, uh, gains 1 electron, minus 1 oxidation state, 2 Cl's, 2 minus 1's, Mg is in plus 2. Mg has stayed at plus 2 throughout, so that's evidence of no reduction or oxidation taking place. Your answer is B. Let's just check this out then. So um, something else here. So we've got SnCl2. Cl is in minus one oxidation state, no charge overall. So Sn is in plus two. Um, four one minuses for the Cl's in minus one oxidation state. The Sn is in plus four. It's gone from plus four up, sorry, plus two up to plus four. It's been oxidized. MnO2. O's in minus two oxidation states, that's minus four. The Mn is in plus four here. Uh, Cl minus two uh, for the two one minuses on the Cl. Minus two plus two, uh, the Mn's in plus two to cancel out the minus one and the minus one on the Cl's. So it's gone from plus four down to plus two. That's been reduced. So your answer is B. Which has the highest first ionization energy? Um, they're all in the same period. So Na, Al, Si and Cl are all in period three. So they've all got the same number of shells. They've all got three shells. Um, and as you go left to right across the, uh, so they've all got the same amount of shielding. As you go left to right across the periodic table, across that period, they're going to have more and more protons and uh, a greater and greater nuclear charge. So as you get a greater and greater nuclear charge, it needs more energy to remove a mole of electrons from molar gaseous atoms. So your answer will be C, the one furthest to the right with the greatest nuclear charge. Your answer is D. 22, what's the empirical form? That's, that's the simplest ratio of atoms of an oxide of nitrogen that contains 26% nitrogen by mass. 
Um, so we're just going to work this through. So 26% of nitrogen by mass, the remaining uh, amount must be oxygen. So 26% is nitrogen. The remainder must be oxygen. 100 minus 26 is 74. Uh, divide by the mass of the atoms to work out the ratio of the number of atoms. So 26 divided by a 14 for a nitrogen is 1.86. 74 divided by 16 is a 4.625. You divide by the smallest so that you get this out as a 1. 1.86 1 divided by 1.86 is a 1. 4.625 divided by 1.86 is 2.49. So let's call it 2.5. The ratio is 1 to 2.5 or 2 to 5. So I've got two N's for every 5 O's. N to O5 is the simplest ratio and the answer is C. Which species is not produced by a redox reaction between solid sodium iodide with concentrated sulfuric acid? So this is a little bit of learning really. Iodide ions are oxidized to iodine. So iodide are minus one. Um, oxidation state iodine is zero. So it's oxidized. So as the iodide ions are oxidized, it itself is oxidized. It's a reducing agent and it can reduce sulfuric acid. Um, sulfuric acid first to sulfur dioxide, then to sulfur and then to hydrogen sulfide. Uh, turn it into oxidation state, down to plus 4, down to 0, and down to minus 2. So basically, you, you could learn this, actually, sodium iodide with sulfuric acid, iodide ions with sulfuric acid, make uh, can make hydrogen sulfide, sulfur, and sulfur dioxide. So your answer, uh, which it's not, is answer A.